to look again at uh, 2 Chronicles 7, the first part of verse 14. God says, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray. You know, prayer by its very nature is a, is a humble act, is it not? In prayer, we talk to God. We recognize that God is God and, and we are not. And the more we pray, the more we talk to God, actually the more that we are transformed from the inside out. Because the more we talk to God, the more we grow in our relationship with God. And the more we're reminded of all that God has already done for us. And there's a transformation that takes place within us. I love the way Richard Foster in his Christian classic celebration of, of discipline talks about prayer. He says, to pray is to change. Prayer is the central avenue God uses to transform us. In prayer, real prayer, we begin to think God's thoughts after him, to desire the things he desires, to love the things he loves, to will the things he wills. We actually see this transformation in prayer in the Psalms of David. Uh, I want to look at just for a moment Psalm 13. You might just turn to the right in your pew Bibles a little bit. Psalm 13. Psalms are right there in the middle of the Bible. And how appropriate, right, that the, the prayer book of the Bible would be in the center because in the center of every life of every disciple should be a life of prayer, uh, a life of conversation with God, talking to God, listening to God. If you read the Psalms, you can see that, well, that David is very open with God. He really pours out his heart to God. And in Psalm 13, we read these powerful words of David. Psalm 13, to the choir master, a psalm of David. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemy say I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. David's pretty upset with God in this psalm, is he not? He's frustrated because God seems to be ignoring his, cr his cr cries for help. How long, O Lord, will you allow this to continue, O God? But then in verse 5, there's a real transition in tone. Listen to what he says. But, this is a huge but here, but I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation, and I will sing to the Lord, because he has dealt bountifully with me. What a transformation. At the beginning of the psalm, you could say that David is even angry with God, upset with God, that God doesn't seem to be responding to his cries for help, his pleas. But then, in verse 5, he says, I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord, because he has dealt bountifully with me. David's attitude and heart moves from then one of anger and frustration to rejoicing. How is that possible? How is it that David could make such a move in his heart? Well, as David pours out his heart to God and he talks candidly with God, he's reminded of how God has delivered him time and time again. David was reminded that as he pours out his heart to God, how God did deliver him. If you remember when he was just a shepherd boy herding his father's sheep, he tells the story that when a, a lion or a bear would come, he was able to drive away that lion or bear and, and to kill him. Or, or when he had to fight Goliath, the giant, you know, God gave him victory that day in battle. It says he pours his heart out to God. He was reminded of who God is and what God has already done for him. And so he moves to praise. Prayer is a principal way that God transforms us. And if you've been with us the last several weeks, you know that we've been doing a sermon series on New Year, New You, transformation, not just resolution. You see, in the beginning of every new year, we all make resolutions, many of us do, that we want to lose weight or we want to, you know, uh, eat better or exercise more often. And now it's February and all those resolutions have fallen to the wayside, right? What we really want is transformation, lasting transformation. And and it's interesting, neuroscientists tell us that actually we are transformed by our habits. We actually live our lives out of habits. You see, our brain likes to develop neuropathways that when we do something over and over and over and over again, well, then our brain naturally will default to that in any decision. So for instance, I learned as a little boy, I've talked about this before, the importance of brushing your teeth before you go to bed. Initially, I had to think about it. I had to use the prefrontal cortex of my brain to really think about that. But now I, I do it naturally because I've been brushing my teeth before I go to bed year after year after year after year after year. And as we look at the life of Jesus, we can see that one of the principal habits of Jesus was the habit of prayer. He was a man of prayer. 
He was constantly praying. In fact, before he launches his ministry, he spends 40 days in the wilderness fasting and praying. Before he appoints his 12 apostles and says, you're going to be my apostles, you know, he, he spends a whole night in prayer. After healing numerous people, he would often go away to be alone to pray. And before he was crucified for all of us, he spent a night in the Garden of Gethsemane praying, pouring out his heart to his heavenly Father saying, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus was a man of, of prayer. It was, his, it was his habit. It was his spiritual practice. And if we want to become like Jesus, we need to do the kinds of things that Jesus did. In fact, his disciples in Luke 11, they noticed how much Jesus prays and said, teach us to pray. They want to learn how to pray like Jesus did. So then in Luke 11, we, we get the Lord's Prayer. And I'm sure we're all very familiar with the Lord's Prayer. We say it here in this service every Sunday, and we're going to do it again because you learn the pr Lord's Prayer not by reading it, but by saying it, right? But how often can we say the Lord's Prayer without really thinking about it? They just roll off our tongue, and we don't really think about what is it that God is instructing us to pray for ourselves and, and for others. Well, this morning I want to spend, as we talk about the habit of prayer, I want, to, I want to look at this model prayer that Jesus has given to us. And I actually want to look at it as it comes to us in Matthew chapter 6. Because in Matthew chapter 6, that's a part of the Sermon on the Mount. And Dale Bruner, the New Testament scholar, points out that, well, that the Lord's Prayer is actually in the very center. It's in the very nucleus of the Sermon on the Mount. And how appropriate, right? Because at the very center of every, any disciple should be a life of prayer. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus teaches us not only how to pray, but ultimately he teaches us how to live. So I want to look at that if we can. Matthew chapter 6, uh, beginning with verse 5. It may be found on page 1030 of your Red Pew Bible. Matthew chapter 6. But before I read God's word, let's call upon his spirit again to guide us in the reading and preaching of his holy word. Please join me as we pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for this model prayer that we have to confess we can often say without really thinking about what it is we're saying. So Lord, as we read these familiar words, I pray that you would speak to us and that we might hear from you. That the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts would be acceptable in your holy sight. We pray this in the strong and precious name of your Son, who is the Christ, and all God's people said, Amen. Matthew chapter 6, beginning with verse 5. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. <clears throat> do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. <coughs> pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Here ends the reading of God's Word as the prophet Isaiah tells us, the grass withers and the flower fades. But the Word of our Lord stands forever. This is the Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> in this prayer that Jesus gives to us, he gives us a model of how we ought to pray. And you know, prayer is ultimately simply a conversation with God where we talk to God and we, and we listen to God. What do you tend to pray for when you think about how you, you, you tend to pray? It was interesting, in preparation for this sermon, I, I found a, a collection of children's prayers that I thought were kind of cute and I'd like to share with you this morning. Little Emily writes this, Dear God, thank you for the baby brother, but what I asked for was a puppy. So, don't always get what we want, do we? She wanted a puppy. She got a brother. Man. Little Steve prayed this, Dear God, can you please send Mike Johnson to a different summer camp this year? He's a jerk, but I'm sure you already know that. <laughs> 
So. Don't want to have to hang out with Mike Johnson, does he? I liked little Billy's true confession about his own prayer life. He said this, I thought about praying for a new bike, but I know God doesn't work that way. So I stole a bike and asked God for forgiveness. <laughs> Pretty sure God doesn't work that way either. Don't want you to steal things and ask for forgiveness. What do you tend to pray for? If we're honest with ourselves, the truth is that when we pray, most of us tend to run to what we would call supplication or request, right? I, I pray for something very specific from God. But it's interesting, Jesus in this model prayer, if you were to look at this prayer in its entirety, you'll see that the first three petitions have nothing to do with us. It's seeking God's name to be hallowed and, and his kingdom to be done and his kingdom to come and his will to be, to be done. It's not until we get the third to the fourth, fifth, and sixth petition that we actually begin to ask for things for ourselves. In fact, in verse 8 of our text, uh, Jesus points out that, you know, don't, you need to pray when you pray. He says, um, do not be like them, the, the Gentiles who like to be very verbose with their prayers and try to impress others with their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Now, I've always struggled with that verse. Jesus says, don't be like them. God already knows what you need before you ask Him. And then I have to ask, well, why ask at all? If God knows what I need, why even ask? Well, John Calvin, who's the founder of the Presbyterian Church, very smart man, made this comment about verse 8 in our text. He writes, believers do not pray with the view of informing God about things unknown to him or of exciting him to do his duty or of urging him as though he were reluctant. On the contrary, they pray in order that they may arouse themselves to seek him, that they may exercise their faith in meditating on his promises they may relieve themselves from their anxieties by pouring them into his bosom in a word that they may declare that from him alone they hope and expect both for themselves and for others all good things. Calvin reminds us that we pray not so much that we can get something from God, but rather we might give our burdens to God and we might grow in our relationship with God. As we pray, like King David prayed, no matter what the circumstances may be, as we give our burdens to God, we are reminded in our conversation with God in prayer well, that God is always with us, God is always for us, and God has always been faithful to us. His prayer is a principal way God transforms us. And prayer is actually response, not something we initiate. I love what Eugene Peterson, who's the author of The Message, the, uh, he's a Presbyterian minister, uh, the English paraphrase of the Bible, he writes, prayer is never the first word, it's always the second word. God has the first word. Prayer is answering speech. It's not primarily address, but response. For God is always acting in our lives and in our world around us. And as we pray, we're reminded of God's activity in our lives. We're reminded that God is always with us, never leaving us, nor forsaking us. His prayer is a principal way God uses to help and grow, it helps us grow in our relationship with him. And Jesus gives us this model of prayer so that we might see what it is we ought to pray for so that we might become the people of God he wants us to be. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. This is a powerful invitation Jesus gives to us in this first petition. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Now, we don't use the word hallowed very much. Probably better to say, may your name be glorified. God, may your name be lifted up. This is an opening of adoration to God because he is our Father who, who is in heaven. Now, I know that today there are many feminist theologians who feel like we shouldn't use the words like Father to speak of God because it seems too patriarchal and they make the case that, well, women who have been abused by their fathers or maybe had absent fathers will have a hard time connecting to a God that we insist we call Father in the Lord's Prayer. Well, the reason that we call God Father is because Jesus did, and he tells us to do the same. For we know from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, that Jesus is the Word made flesh. He is God incarnate, fully God and fully man. He's the ultimate revelation to us of who God is and who is God is calling us to be. So that if we want to know what we should call God, we look to Jesus because, well, Jesus is the ultimate revelation of God. And he alone knows what we are, called to, what we are to call God. 
And of course, Jesus calls God a father because that's what God is. Well, remember that, well, that Jesus, as we say in the, in the uh, Apostles' Creed every week, that he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. Jesus had an earthly mother, but his, but his father was, he was God. And now Jesus invites us into this family relationship to say, hey, you can join me in this family of God. Uh, my father wants to adopt you as his own children, so, so please join me in calling our God Father. In fact, many scholars point out that probably when Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount, he probably gave it in Aramaic, not in Greek. Greek was the language of trade. It was the language people would write, but the average person in Galilee would speak Aramaic, right? And so when, they, when he said uh, Father, he probably used the Aramaic word Abba, which translated in English as Daddy. Like a little baby says Dada, they would say Abba. Daddy, who art in heaven. But what about those women or even men who had abusive fathers? Are we going to insist that they call God Father when, when they didn't have a good earthly father? How, how can they relate to God if we insist that we call God Father? Well, I think that's the point. If we didn't have an earthly father, let me tell you about this heavenly father who loves you, who will never leave you nor forsake you, who loved you so much that he sent his one and only son here to this earth to do for us what we can never do for ourselves, to live in perfect obedience to, to God's word and God's law and then died as the perfect sacrifice for our sins. And then on the third day, rose again, conquering both sin and death on our behalf. Is I believe that the whole point is that we should call God Father because many of us didn't have great fathers, but we want you to know about this Father who does love you with an unconditional, sacrificial love. Now, I actually had a great father. Uh, my dad was an excellent dad, very loving. He modeled Christ to me in so many different ways. But that wasn't my father's story. You see, when my dad was six years old, uh, his father died helping, lay, helping a neighbor lay some electrical lines in Quanah, Texas. He was electrocuted to death. And, and so my dad, at the age of six, lost his father. And my grandmother at the time was pregnant. And, and, and because of the trauma of losing her husband, she gave birth prematurely to a, a baby girl who only lived one day. And so my dad saw his father die and his little sister die. And then sooner after that, his other sister died two years later from polio. My dad experienced death at a very early age. It was very traumatic, and, and my dad has shared with me once that when he, from when he was six to nine years old, he used to pray that he too would die so he wouldn't have to experience that grief and pain. So then I asked my dad, well, what happened at nine that things turned around for you, that, quit, that you quit praying that horrible prayer that you would die? He told me that when, when he was nine years old, the Methodist church brought this tent revivalist, this evangelist to come to, to do a tent revival in Quana. And he went and he, and he got to hear about this heavenly father who would never leave him nor forsake him. Who loved him so much. He sent his own son to die on our behalf. And then we can have a relationship with this father if we will simply come to him. Have you opened your heart to our heavenly father who loves you with an unconditional sacrificial love because once you have the only thing you want is for God's name to be glorified hallowed be your name our father in heaven hallowed be your name your kingdom come what does it mean when we ask God's kingdom to come exactly well, if you read the entire new testament you know that well the kingdom of God is not going to be fully realized here on this earth until Jesus comes back Jesus explains this in Matthew 25 and of course John the Apostle writes about it in Revelation, how the kingdom of God will not be fully realized on this earth until the new heaven and new earth come down with Jesus. And when Jesus comes down, well, it's going to be glorious for those who are in Christ, but for people who are not, judgment is coming. When we pray your kingdom come, we're praying that Jesus might come back. I, I, I look forward to that day, but I know that not everyone I know is ready for Jesus' return. We have classmates and coworkers and neighbors and even family members who aren't ready for the return of Jesus. Because as we read Matthew 25, we can see that, well, as a shepherd separates sheep from goats, so the, the Son of Man, Jesus, will, will separate the sheep and the goats. And only those who are in Christ will have the full assurance of eternal life. Only, them can, only those who are in Christ can claim the blood of Christ having atoned for our sins. Only those who are in Christ are actually clothed with Christ so that his righteousness has been given to us, imputed to us, that we receive it through faith. Is when we pray your kingdom come, it should move us to evangelism. It should move us to share our faith with others, to point others to the reign of Christ in our lives by the way we live, which is what the third commit petition is about. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your will. 
God's will. What is God's will exactly? Well, in light of the Sermon on the Mount, it really means that the Sermon on the Mount might be done, that the Sermon on the Mount might be done in our lives, that we become the kind of people who turn the other cheek when we're insulted, that we become the kind of people who go the extra mile, that we become the kind of people who pray for our enemies, or the kind of people who who do to others what we would have done to us, that we live out the golden rule, that we are merciful, for Jesus tells us, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Is to pray that God's will is done, is to pray that God's will might be done in us as it is in heaven, that we might point others to the reign of Christ in our lives, that they might begin to wonder, who is this man named Jesus that you follow, that we might earn a hearing for the good news of the gospel. I love the way that um, uh, Dale Bruner uh, speaks of uh, this Trinitarian formula, these first three petitions. He writes this, in a Trinitarian way, in the first three petitions, we ask for the hallowing of the name of God the Father, for the coming of the kingdom of God's Son, and for the doing of God's will by the power of His Spirit. The only way we hope to live out the will of God is by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the way that we connect to the Holy Spirit, again, is through prayer, spending time talking to God. And there's nothing wrong with with praying to, to God in public. We see Jesus do that. I know he says, you know, do it behind the closed doors, but it's okay to pray over a meal at a restaurant. But we don't do it to, to be showy. We do it to connect to God, to thank God for what he has provided for us. Now we see Jesus praying in front of others in John 11 before he raises Lazarus from the dead. We see Jesus praying before his disciples in John 17 before he is ultimately arrested. Now there's nothing wrong with praying before others, but we don't pray to be seen by others. We pray to connect with God. As we connect with God, we we can see in this model prayer that we're called to to begin with what God wants first, that, that our will might be conformed to his will as we ask that his name would be glorified, hallowed, that his kingdom was come, that his will would be done. And then we move to the prayers for ourselves. Give us this day our daily bread. Notice that it says our daily bread, not our weekly bread or our monthly bread or the bread that we need for the year. Simply we're asking for basic necessities, not luxuries. I know that here in this sanctuary, most of us aren't really worried about whether or not we're going to eat. We tend to think about what we're going to eat. But I love what Dale Bruner points out, you know, in praying for our daily bread, it's a communal prayer. And the question we should ask ourselves as we pray this prayer is, does everybody have something to eat? Because hunger is a global crisis. There are 795 million people who go hungry every day. But it's not just around the world. There are 37 million people in the United States who believe to go hungry every day for lack of food and lack of resources. That's more than the population of Texas. Yes, we pray that our bread, that give us this day our daily bread. We pray that God might provide not only for us but for our neighbors and that we might be an instrument of that provision, that we might be attuned to the needs of those around us. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. Now, as Presbyterians, I think we're the only ones who pray it this way. If you ever go to an ecumenical gathering, everyone else prays, you know, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And everyone asks you, why do we do it this way? We say, hey, Matthew wrote it that way. So we say it the way Jesus did it. And Matthew, we didn't make it up. He did. But, uh, you know, Jesus' words, right? But Jesus actually uses the Greek word here for debts. It's a term that speaks to this accumulation of demerits. You see, in, in rabbinic thought in the first century, they believed that every time there was a sin, Well, there was an accumulation, it was a demerit, and this accumulation of demerits eventually led to a a large amount of debt that created a dividing wall between the holiness of God and the sinfulness of man. And Jesus uses this term to help us see that, you know what, we're going to ask God to forgive all those debts. What an incredible request. It's like any one of us, I I still owe money on my mortgage. If I were to go to my my bank, Emerald National Bank, and say, I'd just like for you to forgive that $100,000 that I owe, could you just forgive that? I mean, who would do that and expect them to say yes? But Jesus does that. He invites us to do that because he did pay our debts with his death on a cross. And Jesus goes on to explain in verse 14 to 15, very challenging words. He says, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now, taken out of context, it could seem like God's 
Forgiveness is conditional, but it's not. Now, I love what John Stott points out in his commentary on this line. He says, God forgives only the penitent, and that one of the chief evidence of true penitence is a forgiving spirit. If we're truly for regretful for the sins we have committed, then when we come to God asking for forgiveness, in gratitude for his forgiveness, we will seek to offer forgiveness to others. Yes, the Lord's Prayer transforms us, it makes us more evangelistic as we think about the coming of God's kingdom. It makes us more obedient as we seek to, to do God's will here on earth as it is in heaven. It makes us more merciful as we think about those who may not have the daily bread they need. It makes us more forgiving as we ask God for forgiveness and and seek to offer that forgiveness to others. And finally, it keeps us humble as we make a petition for the future and saying, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The Greek word for deliver here can also be translated as snatch or take us away. Reminds me of when we lived in Dallas uh, many years ago, and my daughter Elizabeth uh, was about two years old, and we lived by a very busy street, Audelia. We lived at the corner of Wind Ledge and Audelia, and as we were working out in the front yard, Elizabeth began to wander off towards Audelia, and I freaked out, and so I ran as quickly as I could because I knew that if she walked on Audelia, she would get run over. So as quick as I could, I ran, and I snatched her away from certain danger. And at the end of this prayer, we're asking God to do the same for us because we know we can't handle the temptations of this world. We need his Holy Spirit to, to guide us and lead us and to take us away from the temptations that can so easily cause us to stumble. Yes, the Lord's Prayer ultimately keeps us humble, which is what prayer is, a humble admission to God that we need his help. Please join me as we pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for this model prayer, reminding us that we want your name to be hallowed, to be glorified, reminding us that we want your kingdom to come that we want Christ to return, but we also recognize that not everyone's ready for that. So Lord, help us to be more bold in our evangelism. Help us to point others to your love by doing your will here on earth as it is in heaven. And help us to be more sensitive to the needs of those around us, that those who are hungry, Lord, help us to be a church that continues to give to help meet those needs so that everyone has their daily bread. Help us to be the kind of people who are, who are ready to forgive and offer grace, knowing that we have received grace first from you. And Lord, all humility, lead us not in temptation. We can't handle it. But we thank you for your Holy Spirit who will be with us and will not allow us to be tempted beyond what we can bear, as Paul reminds us in his letters. We pray this in the strong and precious name of your Son who taught us all to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.